my first first prayer meeting I went to when I was at Tyndale House, probably the second week I was there. So, and I didn't really know what to expect, and I was stunned by how many of the prayer requests that things we were praying for were from all over the world. Hmm. Uh, it was uh, this is happening in Africa, and this is happening in Mongolia, and this is happening in you know somewhere in Europe, and this and the things we were praying for was just international. And I had never been in an environment that, that was that internationally minded. Welcome to Conversations with Tyndale House Scholars in America, interviews that highlight the kingdom impact that scholars from Tyndale House bring to the United States. You can find more information about us and listen to all previous content by visiting our website at friendsoftyndalehouse.com. In this episode, Dr. Peter Gurry, Associate Professor of New Testament at Phoenix Seminary, discusses textual criticism and his latest co-authored book, Scribes and Scripture, the amazing story of how we got the Bible. You'll also enjoy his fond remembrance of Tyndale House as he describes it a Disneyland for academics. Let's join the conversation now. Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Tyndale House Scholars in America. My name is Ken Magnuson, and today I'm talking with Peter Gurry. Dr. Gurry is Associate Professor of New Testament at Phoenix Seminary and co-director of the Texts and Canon Institute. He received his undergraduate degree at Moody Bible Institute, his THM at Dallas Theological Seminary, and his PhD at the University of Cambridge. He's authored or co-authored several books and many articles. Peter is married and has six children. Yes, six. So welcome, Peter. Good to talk with you today. It's great to be with you, Ken. All right. So I'm going to really test you and start with a three-part question. Okay. And, And that is, how did you decide to pursue a PhD? How did you end up at Cambridge? And then how did you hear about Tyndale House? That's a great question. Um, you know, the, the timeline's a little bit hazy because this is now it takes me all the way back to my undergraduate years. Mm. But I think it may have been reverse order. I may have heard about Tyndale House as one of the first things mm. and then or at least heard about it as I was becoming interested in a Ph.D. And then, I mean, I suppose I knew about Cambridge already, but um, I think I actually heard about Tyndale House as the first thing that enticed me to Cambridge rather than the other way around. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a professor in, in college who taught, taught me Greek, and he had done his PhD uh, at Tyndale House. I mean, he had done it at um, King's College London, but he had spent spent the whole time at Tyndale House, and he spoke so highly of it, and it seemed like it was such a formative time for him that it was sort of always in the back of my mind. And then as I narrowed into my subject area, knowing that I wanted to teach someday, and that meant getting a PhD, it also coincided that some of the best people in my field were either at Cambridge University or Tyndale House or both. Mm. Uh, and so those those things kind of all came together. Um, but the seeds were planted there as early as my undergraduate degree. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. So d- describe Tyndale House for someone who hasn't been there. Uh, <laughs> what was its significance for you? Yeah. Well, I, the simplest way I like to explain it, Ken, to people is to say, it's it's Disneyland for academics uh, because it's our happy place. OK, <laughs> so if you think about the way kids love Disneyland, that's the way an academic, especially in biblical studies, likes Tyndale House. So what is it beyond that? Well, or what makes it uh, so great? It is a live in non borrowing research library, is what I call it. What does that mean? Well, non borrowing means people can't take the books out of the out of the building. So that means the books that you need are always there. Um, you don't have to worry that you go you go look for a book on the shelf and it's been checked out and now you got to wait three months before you can look at it. Uh, the worst thing that can happen at Tyndale House, you go to the shelf, it's not there, and instead you have to go track it down at somebody's desk and that takes you another couple minutes yeah. and you got to say to the person, hey, can I look at this for just a minute? And they say, sure, and now you're back to work. So it speeds up the process of research enormously because the, the books can't leave the building, okay? Mm. So it's non-borrowing. It's live-in in that they have accommodations right there on site. So for my family and I, we live, we spent all three of our years at, in Cambridge there on site at Tyndale House. And then along with that goes the rich Christian community that's that's there. So there are weekly chapels at Tyndale House. And then 
Uh, we had in the summers, we'd have weekly barbecues. Um, and so just a really rich community that was all connected with the, um, the top level academics and the incredible resources. So, and then and the last piece I should probably add to that, Ken, if it wasn't assumed is it's evangelical. Mm. So um, it was very practically what that meant is like, I remember my first, first prayer meeting I went to when I was at Tyndale house, probably the second week I was there. Or so, and I didn't really know what to expect. And I was stunned by how many of the prayer requests that things we were praying for were from all over the world. Mm. Uh, it was, uh, this is happening in Africa, and this is happening in Mongolia, and this is happening in, you know, somewhere in Europe, and this, and the things we were praying for was just international, and I had never been in an environment that, that was that internationally minded, um, yeah. and specifically with the, with the hope of seeing the gospel spread, you know, and so you might expect, well, it's, a, it's an academic setting, so you're all, you're all sort of, you know, just uh you're so you're so you're in your ivory towers you're not aware of what's going on in the world but i found the opposite to be to be the case because there were people there from all over the world i was more aware of things that were happening in the church globally than probably any other time in my life while i was there yeah yeah that's so that's the short version but yeah yeah of course <laughs> so uh, how did how did your time at Tendo house serve you in your phd studies it, you know if if you were someplace else um you could you could have the same sort of academic work and everything but what was what was it about Tyndale House that may have helped you during those PhD years yeah it's a great question um I just you know it helped enormously and I'll tease that out but I just want to start by saying it was a lot uh, so the joke we used to have when I was there was we knew people wrote dissertations at other schools because we'd read them but we just didn't know how they did <laughs> because it was the combination of the resources which were, which were excellent. It was pretty rare that I needed something that wasn't right there at Tyndall House Library. Um, but then it was the collegiality and the environment. Um, and so it was the prayer meetings and the chapels. It was the tea times twice a day where you could go from being stuck on something in the morning to go to tea time and find somebody with expertise who might just give you that one little tidbit of information that broke the log jam in your own thinking mm -hmm. and sent you back to work and made you more productive. Or, you know, frankly, like it's it's nice to think that that research is all just wonderful, but there are really hard days. <laughs> yeah. There are sometimes spans of days where you feel like you're getting nowhere on something. And sometimes it's just somebody else to pray with you and or encourage you and say no i know it's really hard been really hard this month but you can do it and um you know i could tell you stories about simon sykes the librarian he was a librarian at the time um you know listening to me cry because i didn't think i'd be able to finish my phd because it was too hard <laughs> mm. yeah and and him being an enormous encouragement to me and saying no pete you can do it and i'm praying for you um, so it's a lot of the intangibles and then i think the other piece is academically i found some of the most rigorous um, academic accountability there inside of Tyndale House than even at the university itself. Um, and I used to I used to joke with people, but it was true. And I said this after I finished my own five of my own defense of my dissertation, that if you could survive tea times at Tyndale House, you'll be fine in your viva. Because, you know, I had I had have tea sometimes twice a day with Dirk Yonkin, and, and he knew what I was working on. And it was in his area of expertise. And, and Dirk was happy to ask me really hard questions about yeah. things you know, yeah. and push me. And I really feel like I, I had to answer harder questions from Dirk for a couple of years before I ever had to face my examiners. And so that by the time I did, I was really well prepared for that. Yeah. Yeah. And Dirk might take a little bit of uh, kind of sinister delight in that sort yeah. of <laughs> But I wasn't uh, going to say that, Ken, but I'm no, also not going to deny it. No, it's a, it's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful thing. And uh, no, that's great. I mean, because uh, I think anybody who talks about their time at Tyndall House will mention at some point coffee and tea, but it's mm -hmm. not just about going and getting coffee and tea, no. is it? And uh, no, no. it's it's uh, it's really significant for shaping and sharpening you and everything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can't, under, you, you, that. you can't underestimate, Ken, the value of talking to people about your subject area and just getting that energy that comes from running ideas by people. And I can remember at one point early on talking to my wife and saying, you know, I just, this was early on where I was really having a hard time in my d dissertation writing and saying like, I just don't know how I'd ever be able to write a book, mm. you know? Mm. And by the end, I remember very distinctly it was one day where I came home and I had like three book ideas in one day. Mm. And she just kind of looked at me dumbfounded and was like, do you hear yourself? You know, 
yeah. but it had been after a tea time and yeah. I had been sitting with several of the other um other scholars there and batting ideas around and I and and it was just so energizing and um produced such creativity to be around other people who were um in some cases interested in the same thing things I was but a bit further along in their own expertise and just but just enorm enormously encouraging and helpful yeah that's terrific so you've recently published a book with your Phoenix Seminary colleague, John Mead, called Scribes and Scripture, The Amazing Story of How We Got the Bible. I happen to have a copy <laughs> of it right here uh, yes. for people to see. Uh, and it was recognized by Christianity Today as one of the top books of 2022. So congrats on that. That was Thank terrific. You. But tell yeah. us a little bit about that book, how you came to write it, and the purpose you hope it serves. Sure. So, I, you know, my area of expertise is the manuscripts of the New Testament and what we call textual criticism. So trying to resolve those differences as best we can. Um, and it, it stems from a, just a long interest going all the way back to high school, actually, in the question of how we got the Bible. And so this book is sort of the natural outflow of that really long time interest in the question. Hmm. Um, and maybe more concretely, the book grew out of a series of conferences that John and I have been doing for a couple of years now, where we have gone to churches and taught this material in a series of, of talks. And he does Old Testament, and I do New Testament, and he does canon, and then I do translation. And so if we put all that together, we, we end up getting kind of the whole story of the Bible. And what we found in doing that at churches was there was a lot people didn't know they didn't know. Mm. And um, John and I love this stuff. And so, you know, in a sense, it's second nature to us, but getting to talk to people in the pew about it directly uh, open our eyes a bit to, to how encouraging it can be to people when they learn some of this, the history behind it, um, how much it can strengthen their faith, how it can, you know, offer um, some protection against skepticism. And so we just saw a number of benefits through doing these conferences. And, and what we realized was nobody left the conference saying, wow, you guys didn't say enough. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe you've had this experience in your classrooms, Ken, I don't know. But where the you know the students leave and they think okay that just that was like drinking from a fire hose right? right and and so what we realized was it's a lot of information for people to digest in a conference setting and it'd be really helpful to them if they had it in another format that they could take with them and so that's what we we try to just try to put the conference into a book we were able to add some things that we don't have time for in the conference and um, and just put it in a different format for people so that was kind of the immediate impetus for the book that's great so. You've mentioned a couple of times uh, text criticism. It's it's your area. You've written or co-authored several books on this. For a non-academic audience, what is text criticism and why is it important? Yeah. So really simply, what text criticism is, is a discipline that tries to resolve differences in the copies we have of the Bible. The Bible was hand copied for thousands of years before the printing press came along. In the case of the New Testament, hand copied for you know, about 1500 years. And copying by hand is hard. I always tell people, you know, if you don't believe me, just try it. <laughs> try copying out the book of Romans by hand and see how you do. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so it means that we have work to do as scholars to try to get back to the words of the apostles and their associates um, to determine what the New Testament writers wrote. Mm -hmm. um, and so text criticism is the, is the discipline that, that very simply tries to study those manuscripts um organize those differences catalog them and then sort them out um so the, the end product you might say is something like a printed greek new testament like this one that i make my students use mm. that then gets used by bible translators to put the bible into english and then of course you know hundreds of languages around the world as well so it's really sort of at the foundation you might say of bible translation in that it determines the text the translator will translate yeah yeah thanks that's that's a great concise uh, explanation there. So a couple questions before we wrap this up. One is um, some some academics, even biblical scholars, examine the Bible but keep it at arm's length. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I'm wondering if you might comment on how do you approach the Bible academically without losing your confidence in the Bible as God's word, or maybe mm -hmm. putting it another way, why is it important to you not just to examine the Bible, but to trust it as God's mm. word? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I'll start, maybe start with that last one. The, the reason why it's important is because that's what it is. 
Mm. You know, I mean, I think the question ultimately, fun, the, the question fundamentally comes down to what is the Bible? Yes, it's a record of the past. Yes, it's a collection of writings about God from people in the past. So these are things, you know, maybe a secular scholar who studies the Bible would be happy to say, but we as Christians have to say much more than that. We have to say, not only is it, you know, a collection of writings from people in the past about God, but it is God's word to us. Mm. And that's the most important thing that we can say about it. If, it. if we don't say that about it, then the Bible is no different than any other book. It might be somewhat more interesting than them because of its when it was written or its subject matter, but it has no more authority than any other book does. But if the Bible is God's word, if it's inspired by him, then we as humans, then the, then the most important question we have to answer is, what well, will we respond to it? Will mm. we will we listen to it? Um, so as a scholar, I always view my scholarship then as, you might say, a way of listening to the Bible better. Mm. That's my ultimate goal. When I'm doing text criticism, my goal is to say, you know, let's say I'm deciding between two variants and I might say, well, both of them say things that are theologically true, but I want to know which one is the one that God inspired and therefore, which is the one that I should teach and preach and try to live, do you see? And so even text criticism, you might say, is a way of trying to listen better to God, to try to hear him better using all the tools that he's given me at my disposal, right? So for me as an academic, that means using all my academic gifts and abilities and training, um, for someone who's a stay-at-home mom, that's going to look different, obviously. But in my case, these are the skills and gifts and calling God's given me, so I want to use them to the full. Yeah, excellent, excellent. All right, so before we finish, one last question. What uh, current projects or future projects mm. are you working on? That's a great question. Uh, what am I working on? Too many things, Ken. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, the main one at the moment, though, is well, of course, beside the teaching that I do, is um, writing a commentary in Second Peter and Jude. Hmm. So that's the main thing that's taking my attention these days. Um, I'm trying to think, there's something else. Uh, I'm also one thing, a project that started actually while I was at Tyndale House, and I mentioned to you that I got some book ideas while I was there. Uh, there are some letters in the University Library at Cambridge between two very famous text critics known as Westcott and Hort, hmm. and uh, it was my supervisor and another fellow who was at Tyndale at the time who made me aware that these letters were were there and had never been published and so i'm i'm working to transcribe these letters and i'd like to ultimately get them published because they give a lot of insight into the very important edition that these two scholars produced back in the 19th century oh excellent that's well, sort of a there's not a huge audience for that ken so it's a little bit of a back yeah. burner project but it's a little bit of a labor of love on my part <laughs> yeah and, and you have your ongoing work with the text and canon it's correct that's right yep yeah. so we publish um we publish articles there on the history of the bible and those are for the those are almost always aimed at a wide audience uh mm -hmm. and so we're trying to answer questions about the bible but in a way that um, somebody who's not an academic can understand and appreciate. And so we, we try to do one or two new articles a month there. And I have a, a pretty central role in picking the articles, editing them, and then publishing them. So, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you, Peter, for sharing us with us your work today. And uh, for those viewing this episode of Tyndale House Scholars in America, if you'd like to know more about the ministry of Tyndale House, you can check out our website, at friendsoftendalehouse.com. We really appreciate those of you who support Tyndale House. Your generosity supports the work of biblical scholarship at Tyndale House, people like Peter Gurry. And uh, we very much appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode on the Tyndale House Scholars in America series brought to you by the American Friends of Tyndale House. I'm Dr. Peter Williams, the principal of Tyndale House in Cambridge. I want personally to thank you for joining us for this video. We exist to spread and support good Bible scholarship. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, add notifications, like uh, the videos, share them, and visit our website, friendsoftinderhouse.com, where you can see past episodes and other material. Also, please consider making a donation and even becoming a monthly supporter where you can get behind our work of spreading Bible scholarship in service of the church. Thank you.